I'm very excited to welcome our next speaker. It's a bit of a change from the technical focus we've had so far. It's more big picture stuff. So it's, it's my uh, pleasure to welcome Daniel Sitsunayaka from Edge Impulse to talk about solving edge AI problems with foundation models. Over to you, Dan. I thought so. All right. Thank you very much, everybody. And thanks to all the previous speakers. Um, so yeah, I wanted to sort of change change focus a little bit and talk about a higher level. How do we actually say solve problems on the edge with foundation models? Um, just a quick introduction for me. I'm the director of machine learning at Edge Impulse. Um, we're a company that makes tools for um, edge AI generally. I co-wrote a couple of books in the field and I previously worked on TF Lite and TFLM at Google. I, I want to talk about foundation models and generative AI, and I think it's very important that we separate those two things um, because there's a, a, a lot of sort of overlap with these terms. So foundation models are really models that are um, pre-trained on very broad data sets and then applied to tasks outside of their training. So because of that, that nature, they tend to be quite big. You know, they have to be big to represent this data that they're um, trained on. And you can train across all sorts of data modalities, including mixed modalities. There's a few examples there. So generative AI is when you use models to create data. Um, in addition to consuming raw data, you can, you can create it. And these can, but are not always, be implemented with foundation models. And the size of these can vary a lot depending on the task. And again, they can output all sorts of different types of data. And they've been used for, for many different things. Um, if we look at one type of generative model, a large language model, we can see how these have evolved over time over the last few years. And um, it's quite interesting here to see that there's like the, the maximum threshold for size has gone up and up and up. So we've now got these tremendously large models. There are even bigger ones now that aren't, aren't listed on this. But we also have the models that have stayed pretty small. And the thing that's interesting there is the models that are pretty small have got better and better and better. So as well as the models getting bigger at the top end, the performance, um, as we've seen in some of the earlier presentations of, of some of these models is getting better over time, um, even when we keep the parameters small. So there's a, an example list here. Um, there's a, a nice article there, Battle of the Smallest LLMs. And um, this just lists a bunch. It's a little bit outdated now um, because there's some cool stuff that was mentioned earlier in our session. Um, but you can see how there are some, some relatively small models that are getting relatively good performance. But these are still in the domain where you're going to be running them on, um, at the very least, uh, some kind of SOC type device, like a, a fairly powerful CPU um, or on an edge GPU or some kind of other accelerator. But we're headed in this interesting direction where um, models are getting more efficient at delivering, delivering um, performance per floating point operation. Um, so, you know, the, the amount of quality of task performance that you get from the model is getting better over time per um, site model size and computational complexity. And the efficiency of our compute hardware is getting, um, getting better as well. So this is a you know, completely unscientific made up chart, but we're, we're approaching or we're getting to this intersection where you start to be able to do really big, impressive stuff on relatively low power hardware. And I think that's gonna be very exciting. Um, large models are what we call what the, the, the characteristics that large models have today, the level of um, task related performance will eventually arrive on cheap, low power devices. And I'm really confident in that. But it's not there today, but we don't need to wait. Um, there are actually ways we can get all the benefits or most of the important benefits of these types of things without a lot of time. So really, there are four key capabilities of foundation models. These are the reasons we actually care about the models. It's, you know, not just because it's an exciting new technology, but they deliver a few different capabilities that I'm going to dive into. Um, so zero shot learning is one thing that's really exciting. So zero shot learning is where you can get the model to do something without having to pre-train it for that thing. You have a general pre-trained model and then you can target it to different things. So some example here, I can create an image classifier just by creating a prompt for a multimodal model, asking it to classify, and then it will act as a classifier. Um, if I'm using a BERT-like model, I can provide a prompt and a document and it will 
query the document and find the text within the document that answers the question. And with time series forecasting, even there are um, these sort of zero shot foundation models, which can take a time series and then predict it. And it works across any different, many different time series. Reasoning is another big thing um, that gets people excited. So um, a model that can kind of understand the world and maybe make some decisions. So determining what to do based on um, a uh, sensor reading and some camera footage from a factory, for example, um, or matching a user's intent to an action based on something they're saying. So they're asking for a soda in many different ways. You can still understand what they're saying. Um, or reasoning based on documents. So um, being able to answer questions about a document uh, in, in some kind of uh, formal setting. Information retrieval is also really exciting. Um, you notice there's some overlap here, but um, looking up facts using a model. So the model kind of stores the facts or maybe you use RAG to um, kind of tie in some other data stores, but essentially the model is helping you query some store of data. Um, doing look up across different modalities of data. So you can ask for some music and receive a, a recommendation. Um, answering questions again with documents. And then data generation is the other one. So maybe we can denoise or upscale data. We just saw the super resolution work um, from Haseeb, which is really, really fascinating. Generating text and audio. This is the classic one, you know, that everyone's so pumped about at the moment. Um, Chat GPT being able to talk about stuff and generate images. And then we can generate video and audio. So OpenAI's Sora model, which has been publicized recently, they're generating video from freeform text. So really exciting stuff there. Foundation models are, are able to do a lot of this stuff, right? Um, foundation models are very associated with these types of capabilities today, but they're not necessarily needed to deliver these capabilities. There are plenty of ways of delivering the capabilities without having to use foundation models. And that means that we can get them working in many cases on the edge without having to wait for this intersection of model efficiency and um, computational efficiency. It's something we can access today. These capabilities are things we can design into products now, and we don't have to wait for chat GPT to run on a microcontroller. So zero shot learning is a big one. So um, the benefits of zero shot learning are reducing training data requirements and allowing a task to be adjusted on the fly. Um, so with a big foundation model, you can completely change task on the fly. But if you give yourself some constraints and say, OK, I want to do different types of um, classification on the fly. Maybe I'm doing some sort of on-device training. This is what normal looks like. Does the new input look, look like normal? We can totally do that in other ways, maybe through um, embeddings and nearest neighbor lookup, um, super efficient hybrid of um, classical and deep learning. And um, also just using smaller domain specific models that are trained on one particular domain. They can be a lot smaller instead of hundreds of megabytes BERT model, maybe you can fine tune it and distill a small version which works on a particular um, domain. And um, oh, the other big thing there is you, you can use a zero shot model for labeling your data and then train a conventional model. So it's kind of like data dis knowledge distillation, but it's even easier. Um, that's a really, really easy thing anyone can do. So reasoning on the edge, um, supposedly, you know, this helps us understand user input and um, control complex situations, make sophisticated decisions. Arguably, even the state of the art for reasoning on big models is not that great today. Um, but if we want to kind of get at some of these benefits, we can still do that. So um, for language, we've had plenty of um, language models that can do intent matching and slot filling and that type of stuff um, that don't fall into the bucket of foundation models or generative AI. They're, they're much smaller, much more efficient, easier to work with. Um, we can also use all these incredible algorithms that are pretty ancient, ancient at this point, um, like state machines. Uh, and things that are used often in, in game design to track uh, how different agents are interacting in a virtual space. These have been ways that we've done reasoning in a constrained situation in like real time for a, a very long time. So there's no need to necessarily lean on 
big giant models. And then also smaller domain specific models can be useful here. And for information retrieval, um, we also have benefits of, you know, you can conveniently look stuff up. You have a language based interface. Whether it's easy to get a generative model to give you a, a reliable answer to questions is still TBD, right? Um, that's still something that we're working on at the big level. But you can do some pretty good stuff with small domain specific models again here. Um, with data generation, we've got these large models that can create and manipulate signals and generate all sorts of content. You can definitely train small domain specific generative models that um, work well in a constrained environment. Uh, it's definitely not something you need big giant models for. This is something that you can you can do visual question answering on very small um, model size, for example. You can also do signal, signal generation, so denoising and that type of thing in, in very small models. And you can also use distillation um, from a big generative model. So no need to, to touch the big models there if you don't want to. Um, so with all that in mind, I wanted to go through some quick tips for designing with foundation models at the edge. So the number one would be to frame your problem. Um, this is kind of a workflow step by step. So first, what, which of those capabilities do you actually need? Do you need zero shot learning? Do you need data generation? Can you actually frame your problem more simply as a classification problem or a regression problem and do some of this work during your data generation, for example, so you don't need to deploy the big model? Then figure out your constraints. Um, do you actually need to run on the device? I'm a big fan of these blurp framework here for understanding that. Like, do you actually need to run on device? If not, maybe it makes life simpler to do it in the cloud. If you are on device, what are your capabilities? Is there a non-ML solution or an existing solution that works? Can you use the rule-based approach? Can you use dig digital signal processing? Um, are there pre-trained models that already exist that you can leverage without having to do all this yourself because it's expensive to train the big models? And then if you have to use an on-device model, make sure it's simple. Um, try and use a simple non-foundation model where possible. For zero-shot image um, classification, you can use embeddings and train a k-nearest neighbors algorithm on embeddings. And there you go, you've got on-device um, uh, zero-shot training. Transfer knowledge from foundation models to domain-specific ones via labeling data or via generating synthetic data, really effective approaches. And if you feel like you're running into a bar, then think about increasing complexity, but don't start with the challenge of how do I get this giant, super capable model to run on device. Instead, start thinking about what are the capabilities you actually need and then pick something that fits. So those are my steps. Um, I'd like to talk very quickly about how these things fit into the Edge AI tool chain today, because there are ways that we can use these things earlier in the workflow, rather than just trying to smash them all onto tiny devices. So one is for labeling assistance. So we have this in our product, Edge Impulse. We have an auto labor based on this model called Segment Anything model from Meta. And so if you see the input image here, it's pulling out all of the things that look like they are discrete objects, and then you can easily label them. That's a foundation model used for that. It works generically on any type of object and it massively speeds up labeling. Synthetic data is another huge one. So in the left image, um, we asked Dali to generate a bunch of pictures of people either wearing gloves or not wearing gloves for a classifier. Um, the tutorial there is at the bottom. Um, you can then use that to train a model that transfers to the real world. Same with audio. Um, we have some examples of using Whisper to generate data from keyword for keyword spotting. Um, you can do 2D to 3D or 3D scene synthesis if you want to get really crazy with um, generating synthetic data of situations. We're even using foundation models for training models. So um, it, you might have heard of Velo, which is uh, a versatile learned optimizer. It's a foundation model trained on loads and loads and loads of model training runs. And it basically is a, a really fantastic optimizer that gets generally better performance than other hand-tuned optimizers out there um, using a, a deep learning model. So really interesting to read about. Um, we've integrated this into Edge Impulse as well. So this stuff is really production ready, easy to use.
Uh, what I, I want to touch on last thing is where I think all of this is going in the future. Um, Edge AI and foundation models, I think, go well together. Um, first, we're going to see this hardware software crossover that I talked about earlier, where we get really efficient hardware and really efficient models. I think we still have orders of magnitude of efficiency to unlock with the, the model architectures and our training regimes. Um, so we'll see that happen, and that's going to unlock a lot of possibilities. There's also this idea called disconnectivity, which I, I sort of coined this in a, a blog post, um, which essentially means we're going to have the um, the the need for internet connections for device smart devices to work will gradually go away because we can put more and more uh, connect but, sorry more and more capability on the edge and this is going to be really disruptive because it reduces the need for subscription models um, if you have a model that's baked into the hardware you don't need to have an expensive back end um, and so you don't need to charge customers subscriptions so i think this unlocks a whole load of new use cases which is very exciting i think we'll also see um, hyper optimized like co-optimized hardware and models as a form of intellectual property the same as we have um, silicon ip today the third thing is the curse of generality. We have this idea that like, we want a chat GPT that can take images and audio and output images and audio and do anything you want. And you end up with this huge impractical model you can't deploy anywhere. Um, I don't think that's a great user interface for the future. I think we're gonna see a lot more domain specific user interfaces. So we'll be waving goodbye to these big chatbots and we'll have more smart objects that can help us contextually. And then that also goes into, I think I have two threes there, um, but number four is embodiment. So this doing this stuff on the edge will allow us to put this type of intelligence into products that have the form that represents what they can actually do. Um, so here's an example. Imagine you have an AI television. It looks like a television. It sits there. It doesn't need an internet connection, but it has a model that can generate narratives. It can generate screenplays based on your preferences. And then another model that can generate vision, um, like video and audio. So you can literally sit there and watch an infinite streaming television library that's completely generated on a device sitting in front of you with no internet connection required um, and adapts to your tastes. So this is the kind of thing we're gonna see in the future, I think. Um, it's been really great talking with you and um, Thank you very much. Feel free to check out Edge Impulse or my uh, Substack if you are interested. Awesome. Thank you very much, Dan. I appreciate the very practical uh, you know, discussion. You do have a couple of questions, but we're going to keep those in the Q&A. A uh, big thank you again to all of our sponsors that make this possible. Uh, in particular, thank you to the executive strategic partners of TinyML, Qualcomm AI, Advancing AI Research to Make Efficient AI Ubiquitous, also Sentient, Making Edge AI a Reality, the Platinum Strategic Partners, Embed UR, uh, Sony AI, De uh, Deploy Vision AI at the Edge at Scale, the Gold Strategic Partners, Arm, Edge Impulse, Infineon, Renaissance, ST Micro, and Synaptics, and the Silver Strategic Partners, which we have here AI Zip, Arduino Brainship, Efficient, Greenwaves, Gravity, Climax, Imagimob, Inatera, Noda AI, NXP. Procter & Gamble, Schneider Electric, SunCML, Silicon Labs, and TDK. So that concludes our first day. Don't forget we have a lot more action back agenda for tomorrow as well, starting at the same time. So that concludes our session for today. And thank you for joining everyone. See you tomorrow.